morning. Gingivitis. So, I've been in this business for like 15 years and probably, probably 10 with no day job. Dick, you're fired! Thank you. So, I've been pretty lucky, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's confusing. No one knows how to get paid. So, listen. I made a lot of mistakes in this business. I've had a lot of missed opportunities, and that's mostly just because there's not a source out there that tells you, like, this is how you get paid as a musician. It just doesn't exist. It's a strange industry. It's always changing. It's very confusing. So I thought maybe I would do a five, six part video series. So let's go to the studio, and I'll tell you about these six ways on how I use them to get paid, and hopefully you can use them to get paid too, okay? And we'll start with video number one. This is all about live performances and shows. But first, I better get dressed. I'm still in my jammies. <laughs> all right, let's do it. Nice, Oh, I'll come check it out. So making money as an independent musician, <laughs> it's not always easy, but you know, it's not impossible either. <laughs> so, I mean, it's the most obvious way that musicians make money is you get out there and you play shows, right? I mean, it's simple. That's that's what that's why we're here to be musicians is when I get out there and play music. But you can't just go out there and expect the world without having a couple key things in place. I spent a lot of years slugging it out as an indie band, um, probably a decade, you know, figuring stuff out, trying to figure out how to survive and compete on an indie budget with some of the major label acts. So let's talk about some of the tools that you need to actually be ready to even go find shows or talk to people about something you're trying to do. Very first, you gotta have a set. You can't just have a song and play covers for your whole set. If you're trying to be an independent musician, it's not about hyping up the crowd with cover songs. I think it's such a disservice when I go out on tour and I see opening bands, and you know, quite honestly, I'm in an opening band position a lot of the times for larger artists, but when I go out and see bands opening for larger artists and they fill their, their set with 50 to 75% of covers, it's just, you're just fooling yourself into thinking the audience loves you. So have original music and have a great set. Don't just get up there and play songs. You wanna have something that entertains people. Do breakdowns and interludes, and if you're gonna do a cover, find a cool way to do it, like interject it into a middle of a song, and figure out a way to get the crowd involved, and you just be, you gotta have thought about these things a little bit. What if you're playing to a dead room? What kind of set can you do? How can you adjust your set list? And, and you know, I think it's, it's a great idea for a, a young band to be prepared to play 30 minutes. That's typically what you're gonna be doing as an opening band. As you get better and bigger slots, typically you're gonna be playing 45 or 60 minutes and eventually when you're more of an established artist, maybe 90 minutes and, and that's a pretty long set. So a couple things to be prepared for. Make sure you're taking the audience on a bit of a journey, you know, like don't, don't have a set where there's five slow songs in a row. You might wanna come out with something that's like big and bombastic and get people super hyped and invested in your set before you take them down and do something more sensitive to show a different side of what you do. If you're that type of artist, you know, if you're a metal artist or something, that there's a different strategy at play. But speaking from my own experience as a rock and now country artist, that's something I always keep in mind. So that's, that's one of your tools you gotta have for sure. All right, secondly, and this seems pretty obvious, you gotta be able to be reachable online. You gotta have a very simple website where it's easy to find, nice clean socials, where you know your contact information is readily available and you have to have things that promoters are gonna wanna see. SoundCloud links, 
YouTube clips, all that kind of stuff. You know, having a live video of you playing is your best calling card when you're knocking on the door of a promoter. So you might want to do that. Even if you're just getting started and you're just playing at home, find a way to, to make a cool set with some cool lighting and play a song for the people. Make sure that they know what you do. Hold on. Um, hmm. This one? Ah. God damn it. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about some of the types of shows that are out there for newer artists or people that are trying to get more established. A ton of different ways you can get out there and play. So let's talk about maybe the first one here. So I was just talking with a friend about this who was on tour in the States and they were a brand new band restarting, new nobody. They went for a pay to play option and usually typically this makes me squirm and I don't love pay to plays. We were chatting a little bit today and he kind of gave me a bit of a different take on it. So as a new band, you want to be playing shows and you know, he, he was in a new band, but he was an experienced musician, so he knew what he was getting into. They knew that paying to play meant that they were gonna be on the road, they're gonna be meeting bands, and they might be playing to mostly empty rooms, but they're making connections and they're, you know, making connections with the promoters and meeting people in these cities and meeting these other bands and these other bands' teams. And that can lead to something if you're ready to stick it out for the long haul. So he looked at it more of as like a networking, get your feet wet kind of thing. Unfortunately, you do have to pay money on these kinds of situations. So how it works is there'll be one guy who's kind of like an agent and he sets up a club tour essentially, um, but they're on existing shows that don't necessarily always need another band. And you know, or it's in markets where these these people that are paying to get these shows just can't get to you. So they, they hire a middleman to just get them in the market and away they go. It's not the greatest way to go when you, when you look at what you could be doing otherwise with the money. This is the one takeaway that I found with the pay to play is it's like, sure, you can pay to play, get out there, do a tour, um, maybe to nobody, depending on the situation, but you're meeting people. Here's the thing. If you're paying thousands of dollars to be on a pay to play, I wonder how many people you could reach if you put that thousands of dollars into boosting a video or some sort of content on Facebook. Like you might be better served to do that. Digital marketing is so powerful now and if you can hook people in, you know, if you get 100,000 impressions and 10% watch, that's a lot of people right there as a new band to get in front of to make that many fans. So uh, there's a lot of ways to do it. That's just one of them. So the next one is something that I had a lot of fun doing as a teenager. This was my introduction to playing live. Playing a hall show, like a self-promote. You rent a hall, you get a couple bands together, you sell tickets, the bands share whatever's left after expenses. And it's a really cool way to do it because it's very grassroots, it's very hometown feeling. Your band brings 20 friends, and the other band brings 20 friends, and the other band brings 20 friends. And it becomes this kind of this party that way. And it's, it's kind of fun to do that if you can do it in a small town environment. Doing a self-promote isn't easy though. <laughs> I mean, you're looking at costs of renting the hall, production, lights, figuring out ticketing, security, and things like that. So it all really depends on the venue on how challenging this can be. Some venues might have security and some venues might sell their own liquor. If you're doing a licensed show, you're gonna need permits and things like that too. So a self-promote is kind of tricky, but I love the vibe of it. I think it's super punk rock and it's just like, I don't know, there's nothing stuffy about it. It's really cool, it's refreshing, and so, honestly something I wanna get back into doing because the power is in the hands of the artist, um, which means the artists are engaged and they're trying to sell tickets because they're making all that money. But typically, self-remotes are also quite small. It's gonna be small rooms because nobody wants to, A, have the expense of renting a massive place, or B, have a half-empty room. That's not that's not fun for anybody. So if you're a new band and you're trying to do a self-remote, I recommend starting small. Um, um, I should mention, you know, if you're gonna do this, there's some really cool ways you, you can promote these kinds of things. Earlier I mentioned digital ad strategies. You can do that and hyper target your hometown or wherever you're playing and it's pretty amazing what a few hundred dollars can do when you pump it into really direct Facebook advertising. So that's cool and then there's postering, appearances and, and you can you can hassle radio stations in your area and try and get local newspaper and not, that's all stuff that you can do without a publicist. If you're engaged, trying to sell tickets, you know, 
what I would recommend is don't try and make a lot of money at the beginning. Try and make a lot of fans, because after fans come, that's when the money comes. The more people that know about you, it starts to snowball, it becomes a bit of a, a word of mouth thing, and that's that's the number one way that people are gonna think your music is cool, is that they see other people being invested in what you're doing, so keep that in mind. So the next one is agents. You know, there's a whole video to be done on how to get an agent, um, but I'll summarize it for you. What I did to get my agent was basically I would set a benchmark for myself and I would say, here's where my social media is at, here's where my views are at, here's where my streams are at, here's what's going on on radio, some of the things that I've got going on. Um, you know, I, I would just pick a few agents that represented artists that I liked and people that were you know, not Coldplay's agent. I'm not trying to get those guys. I'm trying to get people that will work for me that I can become a priority for. Um, so yeah, I would I would find these people and update them with what was going on every six, eight weeks. And, um, you know, eventually I, I would book some shows that maybe would have some money coming in and I would send them the contract and say like, hey, I'm gonna do this gig. Do you wanna do this contract for me? And that actually really helped. It showed my investment in them representing me. And from there, I was able to to book an agent, to get an agent. Basically, what an agent does is they go out and they find you great shows. And they have their network of promoters, festivals, and other bands that they can put you with if there's a tour or something great happening that you're a fit for. That's the dream because I'm starting to live in the land of yes where you know I don't have to hustle for that part of it anymore I can use that energy that I'd normally spend on you know grinding for shows on making music and that's the ultimate goal to find people that can continue to do these admin type things so I can focus on being the best artist I can so having an agent is incredible and it's not you know you don't have to have the biggest agent in the world there's a lot of local guys too like there's people probably in your hometown that that uh, have a network Network, even through a couple provinces or states or territories or whatever so I would really recommend it at least sending updates to these people every once in a while communicating some wins and uh, showing them where you're at one thing to consider with an agent is that they're gonna take a cut so an agent will typically take about 15% or 10% probably 10% and that comes off your guarantee of your show they handle all of the, the finances stuff, so they'll get paid, they'll take the cut, send you a check. I love being able to pick up the phone and say, yeah, yeah, I wanna take that show, click, put it in my calendar, done. <laughs>